Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we will be starting this panel. My name is Marek Ostrowski, and I am a senior editor of Politica, a weekly news magazine published in Warsaw. Um, and then, you know very well, it, it is the English language session with no translation. Uh, right. Um, so, um, the subject of, of this panel is uh, transatlantic and European missile defense systems. And if you go through other sessions, uh, you have community of values, energy revolution, then economic integration, then uh, trade agreements, uh, Eastern Europe, energy mix, etc. And then, uh, so, so this subject is uh, uh, far from the mainstream, and also uh, the organizer were, were not uh, smart enough because the conference is such a marvelous uh, setup. I don't know if you saw the children playing in the water, in the sunny weather, in the front of this, of this big building. And so no one really believes in any security threat, I'm afraid, in this place. Uh, but we have very knowledgeable people here. The lineup of, of, of this panel is, uh, I, I feel, exceptional, people who uh, think about security uh, for, 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 for reasonable time, I would say. Uh, so it is for them to, to convince you, if you are not convinced, about the seriousness of, of, of the subject. Uh, let me introduce uh, the panelists. So. To my, to my left, not immediate left, but to my left, is uh, Jeffrey Birchfield. Uh, you have all the bios in, in, in the conference material, so there will be no big introductions. But uh, uh, as you see uh, by his uniform, you, you know who, 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 who he is. Then. To my immediate right, uh, Ian Brzezinski. Uh, Brzezinski is quite a name in Poland, you know. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, then uh, uh, Krzysztof Krzysztofski is, is, is really uh, uh, amazingly important man. Uh, um, because his title is the, the president and CEO of Polish Defense Holding. Huh? And then General Henry Obering III. Uh, who was, um, I would say, in the business of, 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 of missile defense for, for, for a very long time. Um, I was instructed not to make any big introductions. Uh, uh, well, you know that uh, uh, it is the subject of, 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 of a long and complicated history to cut the long story short, let us start with the August 2009 when the agreement was signed in Warsaw between the Americans and, uh, and, and the Polish uh, uh, about the DMD. The, the whole plan was immediately strongly opposed by by Russia, and, and frankly speaking, it did not enjoy any support from our European allies, uh, especially not by, by France, I think. And in 2009, the, the, the project was scaled down to, um, to smaller interceptors, and the reception in, in, in Warsaw, especially by a fraction of the public, was rather, rather negative at that time. 
uh, we will talk about it, I think, because it is still uh, connected to some political problems in, in, in Poland. In the meantime, European allies uh, started, uh, at least on paper, their own plan of, 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 of missile defense, which uh, would uh, complement the American MD to protect Europe. And finally, the, the, the biggest news of this year, uh, of March this year, uh, uh, Polish foreign minister announced in our parliament that Poland is, that it, it, it would spend 33.6 billion euros to set, to set up its own missile shield to defend its territory. Uh, so I draw your attention to, to, to the fact that the subject of the panel is missile defense systems in plural. And, uh, and uh, I hope that our panelists will be able to explain wh what are the connections between these systems. Are threat perceptions uh, of, of all sides are similar or the same or uh, how it works really. And, um, and off we go. Le let me start from, from, from the basic and my first question would be to, 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 to General uh, Obering that uh, there are some scientists uh, I read who uh, still dismiss the MD project as a technical illusion. Could you answer the question whether it is workable, how it differs uh, from what was, what was uh, planned in the beginning? Uh, sure. Uh, can you all hear me? Let's turn on. Uh, First of all, the, there have always been critics of the missile defense program going back to President Reagan's time. In fact, when he rolled it out in 1983, just the intent to build a capability to defend against these missiles, uh, there were groups that were formed to try to prevent the progress of that because for a variety of reasons they thought it would be destabilizing, whatever. Uh, but he had the vision enough to see that as we progress in the future, there may be other countries and there may be other threats, missile threats that we would have to face, and to be able to build the capabilities was very, very important. So today, what have we done? Uh, we've, we have fielded uh, a robust missile capability, missile defense capability against a limited threat that would be presented by a country like Iran or North Korea. Uh, we have deployed radars uh, in Turkey. We've deployed radars in Japan. Uh, we've upgraded radars uh, in Alaska, California, in Thule, Greenland, in England, etc. Um, we have deployed almost 100 sea-based interceptors on nearly 30 Aegis ships, uh, both in the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and in the Pacific region. We've got 30 long-range interceptors in silos in Alaska and California, and we have an additional 14 that was just recently requested by President Obama um, uh, for Fort Greeley, Alaska. Uh, we have deployed a very powerful sea-based X-band radar that's now in Hawaii that will be coming back into operational service pretty soon. And we've deployed uh, batteries of the Terminal Haltude Area Defense Interceptor, nearly 50 of those. Uh, and all of these elements operate in an integrated fashion. The radars work together in a command and control center to be able to provide tracks to these various components, whether it's a sea-based interceptor or a land-based STAD interceptor or even a Patriot Pac-3 interceptor. In terms of the testing, I wanted to see the latest, the latest results on the testing so I, uh, was, since I, I left about four years ago. Uh, today, they've conducted uh, 59 successful intercepts out of 74 attempts. Uh, that includes 10 of 10 for THAAD, 15 of 19 for Aegis, and 3 of 5 for GMD. The two failures there were due to a new operational capability that they installed that they're having trouble with one component. They're having to go back and basically fix that. Uh, we, we get... We often criticize, they talk about, well, 
it doesn't work, the technology doesn't work. The fact of the matter is the technology has caught up with what we've been trying to do in defending against these missiles. And for every uh, PhD uh, from MIT that says that this doesn't work, we have hundreds on the program that say it do, and they are, com they are contributing their lives to do that. Uh, is it a robust system against a Russian or Soviet-style ICBM? No, it's not intended to be that. Uh, and, but it can handle the types of missiles that we think will be thre uh, threat, uh, threatened from Iran or North Korea. Is there any workable defense against the ICBMs? Yes, th this, this system can handle ICBMs, just not a very advanced ICBM, uh, for example, like the Russians would, are, are building today or, the, or the, uh, some of the advanced ICBMs of Chinese. That's not to say that, that the system couldn't be improved and, and, and expanded and developed to do that, but that's not the intent of the United States at this point. We will come back to the problems with the Russians, and I count of you to, on you to, to, to explain it to us. But now, just briefly, if Russian generals uh, uh, keep saying that you can very well outsmart the system by uh, simple decoys, what would be your answer? The answer is no, not, not by simple decoys. There, there, there are techniques that, that we have been developing for years uh, that would address those types of, of countermeasures, those types of decoys. For an example, in the last two tests of the ground-based mid-course interceptor, uh, there were decoys that were flown as, uh, on the target. In addition, the target itself was a solid rocket propellant, which is not what we expect right now from the Iranians um, or the North Koreans for that fact. And when that solid rocket propellant, when it ejects the uh, warhead, there are chunks of the propellant that go with it. So it almost creates its own decoy cloud, so to speak. In both of the tests, even though the interceptor missed, it was not because it did not discriminate the warhead. It did do that correctly. It missed for other reasons. It had a component that went bad that caused the miss. But it did accurately discriminate. So the answer is no. But again, I'm not talking about very advanced threats. And, and I won't go into all the, because that gets technical fairly, technical fairly quickly. But against advanced threats, it's not capable of handling that. Mm. Uh, now, perhaps it is not. It is, it is, it is a rather hard question, but we are uh, among adults, <laughs> I would say. But I remember uh, famous General Eisenhower warning against the. Uh, industrial and military complex. Uh, it was sort. Uh, it was a sort of a of a great legacy of a man who could not be suspected of any uh, anti-American bias. I would say, uh, uh, Ian, it is to you. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, military people wield an immense influence on the decision-making process in, in, in the States and, and probably everywhere. So given the uh, current budgetary constraints uh, in many countries, especially in Europe, uh, could you say that uh, MD systems are, are really the right answer to the right needs? I would say absolutely. I mean, General Obering kind of rolled out kind of a reality of today, which is that uh, ballistic missiles are an increasingly pervasive and pernicious threat. They're almost omnipresent on the battlefield. Look at the contingencies we've dealt with today or over the last year. We continued standoff with Iran, continued standoff with North Korea, and we have a situation in Syria, a horrible situation in Syria, in which ballistic missiles are being used you know, to impose horrible uh, deaths on, on, on people. So it's a, it's a reality. And the fact is, is not only are they proliferating, but friends and foes are benefiting from missiles are becoming more accurate, having increased range, increased diversity of payloads, including payloads of the most lethal variety, carrying weapons of mass destruction. So this is a real problem. There are 30 countries today that have ballistic missiles. There are going to be more of them tomorrow and they're going to have more capable systems. So missile defense is an absolute, absolute reality. And as Trey uh, 
noted, it works. It's proven itself. It's proven itself in combat, at least in two wars in the Middle East. You know, look what countries are doing. L look how much the di dialogue has changed since Ronald Reagan's speech 30 years ago, when it was ridiculed and questioned by people who thought it was, it was uh, uh, a hallucinogenic uh, vision of the future, to those who thought it was dangerously destabilizing. Now NATO has declared it as a primary mission to defend its territory of missile defense. All NATO allies agree to that. Uh, NATO missile defense is its primary defense uh, capability program. I'm, I'm stunned to see at a time, look, here we are in Poland. Poland was criticized five or six years ago for its willingness, five, eight years ago, for its interest and willingness to host a, a missile defense system on its base. It got beat up by the French and the Germans. Well, look at today. We have French, Germans, and Americans competing for a Polish, Ameri for a Polish missile defense uh, program. That's a very big change. So there is unanimity, and it's unanimity that's well justified. Mm. Missile defense is a requirement for force structures. Uh, I turn to you now, uh, seeing your uniform and, and knowing that you work in this division of the American Army, uh, which uh, deals with, with missile defense. Uh, it's, let's say, more a sociological question, but would you say that uh, among American military men, uh, it is uh, a, a, a real service, I mean, appreciated service. It is something uh, like, like seals, I would say. <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't go far as being a seal, but uh, um, yeah, I think so. I think uh, uh, if I had a choice of what I was going to do uh, right now coming to the Air Force, it would be either cyber or missile defense. It's where we're really spending our money uh, now. Uh, I'm proud to be doing this. I've been doing this for a number of years from uh, way back when, when it was uh, at U.S. Space Command till now, and a, a lot of theater time, too. Uh, it's an exciting time. People turn to us for, ask for questions. It keeps us busy. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very good time to be in the Air Force and being in missile defense. Just, you know, two sentences, please. Our cyber war, and, and, and recently the, the Chinese leader was visiting uh, the, the, the States, uh, uh, and, and the subject was very much uh, steered up. Is cyber war in any way connected to missile defense or not? Uh, absolutely. I, uh, part of an integrated air missile defense is to have that, uh, the passive defense, which is you know defense against cyber, uh, the civil warning, that goes out, uh, the radar systems, all that has to be hardened against a cyber war or your whole system kind of falls apart right to begin with. Uh, along with, uh, you know, your active defense, which is the, the missile systems, the integrated air systems, and then uh, t things we've been talking about with Poland, uh, that holistic approach that you have to have both the command and control and you have to have attack ops to go after a... Uh, the, the people that are attacking you because you can't withstand uh, missile, uh, missile attacks forever. Mm -hmm. uh, missile defense is not the end-all be-all. It's to get you to the point where you can attack them and take care of it or, or uh, defend for a certain time to get to, to a peace. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very important to realize. We can't catch all of them. Uh, it's not a 100% umbrella. People talk about an umbrella shield. It's not that. Uh, so, And I think that's where an allied system like NATO comes in mind where, you know, Poland's going to defend to a certain point and then they're going to rely on NATO and the allies to come in and pick up that rest of those pieces. Before we enter our own yard, I mean Polish uh, yard, uh, le let us uh, uh, decipher this plural in systems, uh, transatlantic and European missile defense systems. So I reckon that we have uh, the American system, we have planned U U U U European system, and then many countries like ours either already have or plan to have their own system. How do you see the future? I mean, that is how, how could you imagine the, uh, 
relative uh, engagements between all them or cooperation or integration, uh, whatever. No, okay, I, I would like to maybe to start just uh, briefly. Uh, different country, different treats, different systems. So this is uh, natural. I, I think this is important uh, for all of us to understand that uh, this discussion, we have already started from discussion about the missile defense system, but global missile defense system. And we discuss a uh, long uh, time about that, about participation of Poland, of our country in this global system. But what we are discussing today in Poland, this is not the same, uh, not the same topic. We should understand this, that what we are discussing today, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, air and missile defense system for Poland, not being directly part of, uh, of, uh, of global. So we will be, like, like you mentioned, this is plural, because we would like to be one of those countries from those club, which, uh, which is the uh, owner, which has own defense, missile defense system, which will be one of many, which all together will play for bigger, for stronger NATO, in fact. For stronger, uh, for stronger pact, because uh, uh, all of us, uh, members of uh, NATO, we are responsible uh, as for our global uh, defense, as for our independent uh, capacity uh, to, 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 to defend themselves. Because if we, would like, if we would like to receive some support from the, uh, from the NATO, we would like to be uh, self-dependent also in some... Uh, in, in, in some uh, uh, in, s in some extent, to, to be also responsible for, for, for ourselves. So what we are discussing today in Poland, this is important to understand, we are discussing our all uh, missile defense uh, system and we are discussing about the defense, about different treats than those uh, global uh, treats. We, we are discussing today about middle range, it means uh, up to 100 kilometers air defense. We are discussing in the next step about short range, which is up to 20 kilometers, and in the third, uh, third step we are discussing about very short range, which is below 10 kilometers. And uh, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, my colleague from the panel, uh, Colonel, who, who mentioned that, that we are very much focused, when we are discussing about missile defense system, we are very much focused on missile, because we have missile in the title. Yeah. But, uh, but this is not only about the missile. This is also about, uh, about uh, electronics, very much about communication, command, <laughs> control, about software, about IT. And, uh, and this is, uh, I, I think the missile in the system, this is not very much more than 50% of the, of the cost of the system. Additional 50%, this is cost uh, of radars, cost of electronics, of uh, all those communication, command, control, C, C4 ISR, and all those uh, things. And this is something very important from my perspective, being uh, CEO of the biggest Polish defense, uh, defense group. In fact, by the way, just for some, let me, uh, let me do some uh, small advertisement. This is also the biggest defense group in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, but, uh, uh, but being focused on that, there is a lot of people who are criticizing us, Polish defense industry, that we are not able to participate in building of this system because we don't have missiles of middle range. Yes, we don't have missiles of middle range, we don't have technology to build those missiles, but we are very good and very reliable and uh, well experienced in all those rest part of the system, which is electronics, communication, command and control, and all of that which is as much important, sometimes maybe I agree with Colonel, maybe sometimes even more important, because even if you have fantastic missiles, if you don't know where to shoot, <laughs> you are not able to defend uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. So, not going too deep into technicalities, how could you explain the as I imagine, the necessary cooperation between nations to harmonize all these uh, systems which might be different. So if, if any country like Poland uh, plans its own, to what extent uh, should we uh, take into consideration the other countries, uh, other allies' plans and how? 
briefly, please. We, we actually uh, we started taking steps several years back in connecting uh, the NATO active layer theater to ballistic missile defense system. NATO is building an integration layer for missile defense, and they actually have deployed their first uh, limited operational capability of that. Of that, and we we connected the command and control centers in Europe with the command and control centers in the United States, for example. Uh, we shared information, we shared radar tracks, that type of thing. That's the same type of cooperation that you would see in the, uh, in the U.S. command and control centers that are located here in Europe, uh, along with the, the NATO command and control centers. You, you would see that radar data sharing, you would see uh, information about uh, the threats and th that type of thing that would be coming into those command and control centers. And then, then they would go through uh, a, a whole series, and they've done actually some of this already, uh, and, and uh, Colonel Birchfield can probably talk to that much better than I can. And they go through and work out the operational concepts of how they would employ these assets uh, because it, it is very important that, as you say, the integration of this is what is really important, to be able to take these variety of sensors and integrate those together into the command and control centers and to be able to provide the layered coverage from the various missiles. Um, also, to Ian's point, uh, I was just in a conference in London yesterday. That's I just came in this morning. It is remarkable. I mean, absolutely remarkable how the attitudes toward missile defense and NATO have changed. I mean, dramatically. For when I when I first briefed the NATO Council in 2004 to today, it is just an incredible change. They they all want to get on board. They all want to to develop their own systems and to be able to to, to get this into uh, an integrated layer that can then be complemented by the U.S. capabilities. So I think it's. Um, I think it can be done if we've actually passed the electronic data that we've had to in the past to show that it can be done. And, and it's a matter now of working out the operational concepts and how we employ these, uh, these systems collectively. And that includes the sovereign control of, 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 the, of the Polish components. Colonel, w would you add something to this uh, description? Uh, sure. Uh, the general said it just right. Uh, it's already been operationalized and tested uh, that we can uh, run cap capabilities put uh, any, any missile system into the capability of NATO because uh, the European phases after approach is our, our contribution to NATO. So NATO will run this and uh, the, the Tipi-2 that's in Turkey right now will send radar feeds through NATO and that's how we'll, uh, we'll, we'll launch against any strike. So uh, uh, you're talking a little bit about operationalizing it and, and we're getting there, we're doing tests and exercises to ensure that each time we can do this, we do it r correctly, and we understand uh, both politically and militarily what this means in the end. That's, uh, that's probably the biggest thing that, uh, that uh, NATO has adopted this fully, and at the same time said, hold on, we want to talk about this. And launch to intercept to impact, there's not enough time to talk. This is, this is pushing it down to the lowest point which some countries are not used to. This mm -hmm. is the, 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 the lieutenant or the, you know, the guy sitting on the ship that's going to push the button to make the intercept, and he has just a couple minutes. And uh, that's the biggest realization that NATO has to take in, and they're, they're slowly getting that right. So. Now to Ian, please. So uh, Many years ago, I had a privilege and, and pleasure and honor to talk to your father, and I ask him a, 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 a rather simple question. That is, uh, coming back to 1939, uh, I uh, ask him what such a little country can really <laughs> do uh, in, in, in the military field, uh, which, which is not simple. And I was struck by his answer. He said, you should have maybe even small, but a decisive force to clear sharply the murky situation of the first day. I understood his answer as to being able to show others that just in case, uh, God <laughs> save us from that, but that it is a real conflict, not just, you know, a, a sort of a, <laughs> a thing which 
the others can explain as, uh, well, we can negotiate or uh, we must uh, uh, call up for the committee to, you know, to, to reconcile the, 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 the parties, etc. As in the beginning of the, of the, of, of the Second World War, huh? there, there were efforts by Italy or whatever. Huh? I read your paper describing the Polish effort, and then I arbitrarily choose you to <laughs> present the Polish effort as you see it. <laughs> One, I, I found over the years that it's uh, dangerous territory to contradict my father. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I can say, I think, I, I don't know when you talk to him, but I've also found him usually prescient. And when I think of the, the rationale for missile defense in Poland, I think it's consistent with what he, what he told you. When... When Poland wants to invest, and it's a significant investment, it would be somewhere between four and six, maybe more billion dollars in a defense budget that's not insignificant, but not the size of the United States. One has to be very careful about how one's going to use those, those, those dollars or those lotties. And I think it's being used in the right, for the right reason, for exactly the, the uh, scenario that my father described to you. I'm a little less worried about the overwhelming World War II style threat against Poland. Poland couldn't afford to buy enough missile defense systems to create an Iron Dome umbrella over it if there was a real effort by a neighbor to annihilate it with, with, with missiles. But that's not the most urgent threat. I think the real threat that Poland has on its, on its eastern frontiers is the kind of steadily growing volatility we see particularly in Russia, a little bit in Belarus. And what I'm worried about is is some sort of unrest spiraling out of control and a scenario in which an aggressor trying to, for whatever reason, gain control of that feels it important to snatch a bit of territory. And ballistic missiles could be very useful in that regard because they're fast, they're accurate, they have payloads, they don't have to have WMD, but have payloads that can cripple uh, a nation's ability to respond effectively crater um, airfields, shut down a command and control system. And you don't need many to do that. So by investing in, in, in missile defense, Poland's developing for itself a capability that will deny an aggressor to the ability to leverage the speed, the accuracy of, 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 its missile of its missile systems. And that gives Poland a greater ability to want to dur. It gives Poland great ability to control the escalation of the crisis. It gives Poland the ability to buy time so that allies can, can react to the situation and make the right decision to come in and support. If Poland buys the right systems, it will have missile systems that will be fully compatible with those of its, of, of, of its neighbors. That will increase the prospects of, 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 of effective reinforcement. These are, that is the contingency that where I think that uh, Poland's investment is justified. And I'd also add that by investing in, in missile defense, Poland will be investing in a capability that NATO needs more of, as demonstrated by the deployment of uh, Patriot systems down, down into Turkey. Uh, in, by contributing more to that NATO capability in NATO, Poland's not only being a good ally, but it's increasing its leverage and leadership role in the alliance. I have only two uh, other subjects, however big, uh, to, to raise, and then we will turn up to, to our audience with uh, questions and, 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 and short comments. Uh, so these two subjects are money and Russia. <laughs> So take, take the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so money, <laughs> money, money first. Uh, uh, somehow, uh, I risk uh, mm -hmm. in front of our American friends that uh, we were somehow disillusioned by, by the Americans. At least I feel like that. Uh, 
our expectations uh, with this F-16 contract were much, much higher. And uh, uh, because of the offset question, you know. Uh, uh, well, nothing surprising. Uh, I mean, the Americans proved to be uh, uh, better businessmen and, and they are capable to count dollars much faster than we do uh, because they live with dollars uh, for, for quite, <laughs> quite longer time than... For more than centuries. <laughs> yeah, for more than centuries. So no, nothing, nothing really uh, extraordinary with that. But uh, as uh, our government uh, uh, produced a figure of uh, 33.6 uh, billion euros. It is within the span of uh, 10 years, I think. But still, it is considerable money. And this big piece of cake <coughs> is now, I think, of the interest to many. Uh, it happens that uh, uh, yesterday, the Israeli prime minister was, was in Poland, and uh, I hear that there are also talks about uh, Israeli systems. Uh, and there are other countries uh, which we take uh, in consideration as partners. But the president of the Polish defense holding <laughs> might be, uh, I think, a bit worried by, by uh, let's say, others trying to uh, have something out of this uh, cake. So what is your take on it? Okay, maybe, maybe starting from my impressions after yesterday communication of our prime minister after meeting with prime minister of uh, Israel, it was mainly about education. I, I, I found out that it was mainly about education of children in Poland, in Israel. And then just at the end of the meeting, uh, our prime minister mentioned that it was only in four eyes, without our minister of education, also about defense a bit. Uh, so, so mainly it, it was about education. Uh, but uh, uh, coming back to... to Some to, to, people to tell to me <laughs> otherwise. <but> <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just based on, on, on a press conference. Um, yes, in, indeed. Uh, we are in a very specific situation in Poland as a Polish defense industry. We are very specific. We can say we are almost alone in the European Union. Uh, only one market. No, in fact, there are two markets in which now in the European Union there is increasing of expenditures for defense. This is Poland and slightly smaller Estonia. So that is why maybe we are, we are more, uh, more in the, uh, on, on the radar screen of, uh, uh, of our partners uh, and uh, colleagues uh, from defense industry, not only from Europe but also from, uh, from US, generally also from, uh, from Israel and other parts of, of the world. Uh, in fact, uh, those uh, uh, numbers which uh, were mentioned uh, by our Prime Minister and then by Minister of Defense, this is very, very, very big increase of, of expenditures for modernization of our army because it was mentioned 137 billion, 138 <coughs> billion of Polish złoty in next 10 years as a expenditures for modernization in comparison with roughly 7 billion uh, Polish what uh, yearly uh, those times so 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 we are we are talking about double on average which which means maybe triple after uh, after 10 uh, 10 years this is uh, really something significant now why uh, maybe and, and this is something which I would like to add to to, to this question which was mentioned which was uh, uh, which was asking by you to ask by you to to, to Ian uh, about wh wh why we would like to be stronger than we are. I think this is obvious. Sorry for for some uh, a trivial response, but this is like with uh, children in school, you should be uh, strong enough to defend your your snack before you ask your friends to come and help you. So I think uh, th this is what we what we have to achieve. This is this level of uh, uh, of self uh, self. Uh, dependence of uh, 
self-reliance uh, that that we are strong enough uh, to uh, sometime even not not to fight just to be um, just to be resistant for kind of blackmailing because sometimes if you are not strong enough you could be uh, really attacked not by 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 real attack but you could be attacked just by kind of blackmailing you you, you could be uh, you, you could be put in the position in which somebody asks you for something, you have to give him it because you don't have enough force to, to resist him. This is very important and this is my also understanding of, uh, of this effort which has been mentioned by our Prime Minister, Minister of Defense. Now about the, the, the sharing of the, of the cake. Uh, being uh, the company which, uh, which is from Polish perspective, we are in the first hundred biggest companies in Poland. Uh, uh, we are 15 biggest uh, uh, state-owned company in Poland, but from the global perspective, we are a company with slightly more than one billion tar uh, one billion dollar turnover, which is, uh, let's say, 20 something position in in Europe, uh, but uh, regarding uh, entire entire world uh, of defense uh, industry, we are maybe in the first 50 but rather at the end of this uh, of this 50 so we are not so big to be to be completely alone and still better than the football no, still, team no still better than football team <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but maybe they will be better we we will try to to be better now it's obvious that uh, we are part of global of global uh, business today and the defense industry every day is becoming more and more global and we have to be open for cooperation now uh, there is a, a big discussion uh, about that there is even some kind of fashion for new word which is competition yes that's true sometimes we have to compete with uh, our partners sometimes we have to cooperate with them and this is natural as i mentioned before we are not able in poland to produce uh, by ourselves uh, uh, missiles uh, for uh, uh, middle range uh, middle range uh, for for missile defense but we could uh, in in some uh, cooperation with our foreign partners to build entire system i am fully convinced that we are able to build entire system together with them as a leader of the system because of our capability to be integrator to be uh, integrator from the point of view of communication command control what i mentioned before also because of our great experience regarding radars i would like to to add to, uh, now some some anecdote because this is always in poland we polish people we don't believe in our technological capacity Th this is why uh, many many polish companies which are even technologically advanced they are looking for changing some names uh, for something matrix, hat tricks, bitrix, just not to be uh, recognized that, that this is Polish company because if this is Polish, not cannot be uh, cannot be reliable regarding from technological point of view. And we have uh, we have very nice uh, example. Just ten years ago, our Ministry of Defense decided to build in Poland so-called backbone, six big radars to to control entire our uh, our entire air. Uh, uh, around uh, around uh, Poland, Earth space, and it was very long discussion that uh, certainly we have to buy this outside of Poland because we are too stupid to build it by ourselves. Finally, we decided, okay, let's try, let's try to give free to build in Poland. Okay, finally, maybe we don't have this, we don't need this free, <laughs> and then buy from the shelf this free additional from outside from one of European country very. Uh, very advanced in technology. So what we have the result, because this is my company, my company uh, delivered five years ago these three uh, uh, radars, they are working for five years, and those additional three radars from the shelf has been already just few a few months ago delivered, but still no, they are not working. So, so this is just example that we are not so bad like somebody could uh, think about uh, about uh, that, and uh, uh, but coming back, we are not only ready to share. We we have to understand that this is the only way of cooperation. But if we are open to share our domestic market with our partners, we also very loudly uh, we are asking our partners, please share with us your domestic markets because this system in which we were in the past 
Polish defense industry, we were, and this is example of offset some, somehow. We were very happy that part for, of expenditures of Polish government came to Polish industry because we had so good relation with our foreign uh, partners that they allow us to participate in expenditures of Polish, of Polish uh, uh, government. Now I'm asking for more. I'm saying, okay, we are open to cooperate with you in Polish market, but please be so open to cooperate with us on other, uh, not only European, but global, global markets. This is what we really need today. Who would like to comment it? I don't think anyone doubts Polish capabilities. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons why people are rushing in this market is not just because it's, it's got a $40 billion investment, but they see the Polish military and they see Polish, in, Polish industry as serious. But when you think about missile defense systems and you link it to industrial development, which is what your government has done, they've emphasized three things. State-of-the-art technology, NATO interoperability, and it's got to be the, well, I guess one phrase a senior official said this, a Marshall Plan for Polish industry. I think those are all legitimate objectives. But then you've got to take your strategy one step forward. You've got to think about what you can afford. You've got to think about what you're jumping into, because it is new technology, new capability for the Polish military and for Polish industry. So you want to think about, am I looking at partnerships that are going to bring me a system that is still on the, on the charts of being developed, or am I going to go with systems that are proven? And existing. Systems that are underdeveloped could affect your timelines because you don't know when they're really going to be completed and ready for production. Systems that are under development increase greater risk to your ability to integrate those systems into your force structure, into your industry, to meet deadlines and to meet operational requirements. Then you also want to think, I think, is from an industrial perspective, what is the community of users that this system brings with it? Because that is, that is not only just a community of users, it's a market. Some systems out there maybe have markets for one with Poland, two countries, and then they have to build market share out, outside of that. That's very difficult. They might be developmental, so they're limited, again, to one country or two countries. You want to be careful you don't bind yourself in a situation where your market is Poland and your partner. There are systems out there that, have, that are used by multiple countries, and you should properly negotiate work share and, and development share with those because if you do so you'll have an established market. When I look at a system, Patriot for example, 12 nations. If you tally up the defense budgets of those 12 nations, that's about 800 billion dollars. All right, it's not all procurement. Let's say 20 percent of that, 25 percent is procurement. That's 200 billion dollars a year times five for a five-year plan. That's a trillion dollar procurement market and it's in the defense establishments in the most modern defense establishments of, of the world. That's established market share that you can cut into. It's very hard to walk into an established market. So those are things that I would think about. And then operationally, you know, there are different systems out there. Those who, have, who share the same systems you are those who you're going to be able and probably end up training the most with, relying upon the most with, be it for a Polish expeditionary operation or for an Article 5 contingency. But then, then you, you, you are telling me that it is not so easy to compete with us. No, I, I see, uh, not, I don't see it as a matter of com competition. I see it as a matter of uh, joining forces and leveraging market opportunity in a way that, and from an American perspective, because I would, like po I would like Poland to have an American system that it works on together with, because that deepens our military-to-military -military relationship, that deepens our industrial relationship, mm -hmm. That creates two important constituencies to sustain that, that, that relationship in, in both polities. Uh, and it enhances the, the alliance and its capabilities. So, so it's, a, it's a triple win. Mayor, Mayor, before we leave the subject of cost, I just want to add a, a very different, not, not uh, in this line of thinking, but putting cost in perspective. Uh, okay. If you look at every penny that the United States has spent on missile defense going back to Ronald Reagan's speech in March of 83, it's about $150 billion, including this year, $150 billion. The attack on New York in 9-11 alone was, by most estimates, between $80 and $100 billion damage, damage cost alone. 
That's one strike on one American city that wasn't a we weapon of mass destruction at all. So we tend to put this in perspective. We spend, a lot, we spend anywhere from 8 to $10 billion on missile defense a year in the United States. That's still less than 2% of our budget. But think of the return on that if you can prevent just one attack on one large American city like that. So I think that you have to put these, these costs in perspective when you're talking about defense spending. Right. Um, uh, time is running fast. Uh, so my last subject is, is Russia. And uh, I remind you, General, that in the early phase of the ND project, uh, uh, you yourself, I had a chance of, of, of talking to you a couple of years ago. And you were then. I feel convincing me that you can yourself convince the Russian generals that they uh, could very well cooperate with you in the whole endeavor. What is your take today? We, we did, but we didn't convince the Russian leadership. Um, and that's what happened. So um, one of the things America is referring to is I was part of a group, a working group, that was headed up by the former National Security Advisor to, to the President Bush, Steve Hadley. Uh, Igor Ivanov was on the group. Uh, also, there were several retired general officers, including some of my counterparts in, in Russia. And we actually developed an architecture for cooperation between uh, NATO and Russia that would not release any sensitive technology either way. It would not involve any, uh, any kind of authority of NATO over defending US ter uh, Russian territory or vice versa. It was primarily an information sharing architecture and, 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 and a trust building architecture. Uh, but we could not get that to go forward. Um, we just didn't have any luck uh, when it went above the uh, retired uh, Russian general uh, level. Um, the implicit question is where is Russian uh, NATO cooperation now on missile defense? I, I'm very pessimistic. I, even with the cancellation uh, of the 2B missile, which was, that was the missile that was to be part of the phase four of the European phase adaptive approach that could not only provide protection for Europe, but also for the United States. And that missile was canceled by President Obama several months ago because of developmental pr problems with the missile. Uh, even with that, uh, I don't see any surge in Russian cooperation uh, with NATO. I, and, and, and frankly, my own personal opinion, uh, this is not about the missiles. It's not about the interceptors. It's not about the radars. It's geopolitical. That's all it is. So, so I guess I've come to the realization that it is, you, you almost can't mitigate that through technical means or, uh, or otherwise. It's, it's got to be a geopolitical uh, discussion. Mm. Yes, and, and, and now we will uh, turn to you, please. Uh, if you have uh, any specific questions. Uh, yes, and uh, sorry, if you also have comments, please, you, you are allowed, of course, to comment, but please be short, otherwise you risk to be uh, uh, taken as moderators in the next panel. So, <laughs> okay, uh, to you, please. Uh, and, and please uh, just uh, say briefly your name and affiliation. Sure, very briefly. Michael Baranowski, I'm the director of the GMF Warsaw office. Uh, one quick question to Ian, without any comments. Ian, the MD is, is really sort of a microcosm of Polish-American relations to some extent. With the 2009 decision, now with the cancellation of phase four, what would be your recommendation, now that you are outside of the government, to the Obama administration for, for, uh, for the continuation of EPAA? That's one thing. Con on the, on the Russia piece, also, just to follow up, uh, I mean, from, from our colleague Celeste Wallander, she, she was just coming back from Moscow and mentioned that now Russia is talking about problem with global missile defense. So we no longer have problem with the phase four. Now we have problem with global. How do we approach Russians on this? We will take some more questions, okay, before answering, please. This is actually a comment rather than a uh, question. Uh, 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 Wait, 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 please, for, for the mic. Uh, okay, but don't, 
So, since I have the microphone, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, to comment on, on a point that was made uh, earlier, a discussion of the threat and also a discussion of the process in NATO. My, my name is Peter Flory uh, with Kinetic North America. Uh, I was responsible for missile defense at NATO from the time General Obering uh, made his first of many trips to Europe till shortly before the Lisbon summit when NATO adopted missile defense. And the questions that were raised earlier about the threat why do we have to worry about this in Europe? We're very much on people's, uh, on people's minds. And w what happened was an extensive uh, four-year consultation process, and General Obring uh, led a lot of this. In fact, at one point, he, it was a full-page uh, picture in Figaro, uh, uh, an article on him, which is not an honor accorded to every, ger every uh, American general. But the, the uh, discussion in NATO focused on the whole spectrum of utility of missile defense. It wasn't just the last five minutes when there's a warhead coming in, what do you do? Uh, it was uh, a discussion of um, what are the benefits you get of the, the assurance of having missile defenses, uh, a, a sort of an insurance policy. And that was the issue that was most important for some countries. There's the question of missile defense's role in dissuading the development of ballistic missiles by undercutting their utility. Ian alluded to that earlier. Uh, there was the question of deterrence in the crisis, but as important for many nations was the ability not to be deterred. So it was the freedom of action uh, uh, argument. Uh, in Libya, for example, if Gaddafi had had uh, ballistic missiles uh, that had been able to reach Europe, what, how, how might NATO, how might Europe have reacted, uh, reacted differently? And then finally, at the end of the day, if, if all these other things fail, if they don't produce the desired result, then, of course, uh, you have the ability to, to defeat an actual attack. But the, uh, it took three and a half years for this debate or four years for this debate to produce that sort of broader understanding. But I think it's important to go beyond the important and, and, and uh, le legitimate question, uh, is somebody in Iran going to wake up one morning and decide that we want to hit Poland out of, the, out of the blue just for the fun of it? That wasn't really what it was about. It was about a much broader spectrum of uh, what you might call sort of strategic utility. So this Polish question first, please. Okay. I think Pol Polish-American missile defense cooperation can and should be a deep pillar of the bilateral relationship. I see enormous potential for it. I think, however, over the last 12 years, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration have sort of mishandled it. It's become more of a thorn that has accentuated the uncertainty of American commitments rather than the deepness of American commitment to, to, to Polish security. Uh, I was part of the delegations that rolled out the idea of a third site here in Poland back in 2002, I think it was. Bush administration waited six, seven years before we came to conclusion on that. That certainly put the, the polls at ease. Then the Obama administration came in, and with little to no consultation on a bad day, they flipped out the whole uh, construct of the, of the arch missile defense architecture. And of course, postponed the de deployment of the third site to Poland by, uh, by, by five years. This year, the third site would have been here under the old plan. Then you go on, and uh, just more recently, you had, again, kind of uh, with little to no consultation, a changing in the, in, in, in the uh, EPAA directly affecting Poland, which is the type of systems would happen here. I'm not saying the decisions in terms of what their ultimate outcome were, were bad. They were just badly handled. And that's been a source of uncertainty for the Poles. They don't know, they're not as confident that we can be relied upon from administration to administration, and sometimes even with an administration, whether we're serious. Now, what to do about that? Um, what to do to make people more confident that EPA is going to be an, an inevitable reality? I would do four things. First, I would accelerate the uh, construction of the site for phase three. I'd start pouring cement this year. I'd put putting up fences. I'd put one or two U.S. soldiers out there, m maybe a few more, just to make it clear that there's no turning back on that. Because right now, all it is is theory and words. And I think that fact that it's Ethereum words actually invites the Russians to attack it because they see a possibility that maybe they could reverse that decision. And we've communicated that it's possible to reverse that decision. So pour cement, start exercising, engage the poles in it. Second thing, remove the conditionality of the EPAA. Many administration officials have come in from the Obama administration and said, our commitment to third sites is ironclad, and that's great. The problem is the president gives the guidance 
and his speech from Prague still stands, which says that EPAA, the European phase adaptable approach, can be changed if the Iranian threat goes away. So link EPAA in the third site to the reality that m ballistic missiles are, are a pernicious and growing threat, and we have to have missile defenses regardless. Tie it to that. Third, or third, change the name EPA. Get adaptable out of there. Call it something like the transatlantic missile defense system. Adaptable conveys conditionality, uncertainty. Get the name out of it. And then finally, the United States really, need, I think, needs to step up the amount of interest it's showing in Poland's missile defense programs and the drivers behind Poland's missile defense program. Uh, I think it needs to up the level of engagement we have with the Poles on, 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 on missile defense cooperation. Uh, and my last point would be, I think there's a great opportunity coming up. In September, you're going to have the Zapad 2013. We know what happened with last Zapad 2013. That's a Russian military exercise. It ended in the nuclear annihilation of a country that looked a lot like Poland. In November, we're going to have Steadfast Jazz. The United States is putting little to nothing in that exercise. Steadfast Jazz is a, is a significant NATO Article 5 contingency exercise here in Poland. The United States is putting in, after it's promising, quote unquote, after it's reduced our force structure in Europe and promised more military to military training, is only sending a company to this exercise. That's a terrible signal. So why don't we adjust the scenario a little bit, have a missile defense di dimension to it, and roll in a Patriot battery. That's a great way to demonstrate support for Poland. It's a great way to, to engage the Polish military in exercises that will expand its readiness to take on the capability set it's, 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 it's determined to do. General, you, you remember, please, two questions about Russia, one from the gentleman here and the second one from Yes. Uh, First of all, uh, in the conference I was just in in, in, um, in London, uh, it, the, the, there was Russian representation there, and and they said the same thing. They're they're beginning to expand their their uh, complaints about the entire system. Um, the the response to that point of view at the conference was it was almost a so what. The Cold War is over. We're not in that world anymore. We have to worry about threats such as Iran and North Korea that have nothing to do with Russia. And, and that was the, almost a collective response, is, is that you got to get over it. We're not in the Cold War anymore. And, and, and can we destroy Russia five times over? Yes. Can they do? Yes. You know, but that is, that is not the world we live in right now. What was the question about? Uh, Steve, uh, uh, Peter? Did you have a question, Peter? No, I, uh, uh, buried in my comment. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're you're talking, so. Celeste Wallander, American University and German Marshall Fund. Um, it seems to me there's a little bit of a contradiction or confusion on the panel and uh, as, a, as a result of a great discussion. And I thought as I give, ask a question, they gave an opportunity for clarifying. Um, one could get the impression, um, despite the general's very clear statement that EPAA is neither directed at nor capable of uh, shooting down Russian missiles, and uh, one could and in light of the fact that that's official NATO policy and official U.S. government policy, last I checked, and the discussion of the great technological advances on integration capabilities on Alt-BMD in the context of EPAA and talking about countering missiles with a 10-kilometer range, that that's not U.S. official policy. So it seemed like an important point because I think I think that um, all of the points here were made were valid, um, and everyone had something to contribute to it, but woven together, it might have given an impression, and, and I was hoping you could clarify that. that is, uh, I, will follow, I will follow up a bit, a bit, because obviously we don't have <laughs> much time, but I just omitted the question of differences in the threat perceptions. I, I would like to ask you, uh, 
maybe we will still have time for a very brief answers. How could countries with different threat perceptions cooperate into building a, a reasonable, uh, engaging systems? Uh, do, do you see problems in it or not? Because the lady here uh, just mentioned this very short range uh, missiles and, and said it is not our program. Uh, uh, it is ours, I hope. Uh, yeah. Okay, who, who volunteers for to answer? I, I'll take a shot. I mean, different threat perceptions. Uh, there are different threat perceptions in the alliance. I think countries in Central Europe are probably li a little bit more immediately focused on challenges to the east. Countries down in, in along the Mediterranean, a little bit more focused what's going on in Syria, a little bit more focused what's going on in, 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 in the Maghreb. But what's interesting is, is that to deal with those different challenges, if particularly if they're ballistic missile challenges, you need missile defense. So missile defense capabilities that are deployed and, and, and developed or introduced in, into military establishments in the north and in the south can be mutually reinforcing, particularly if they're mobile and transportable. And we've seen that in action in Syria. Uh, I don't think Germany feels an immediate threat uh, from, from Syria, but it's deployed its systems, along with the Americans and, and, and the Dutch, uh, into, a, into a kind of sort of inner outer area uh, operation, even though the threats aren't 100% synonymous to them. That's the value of NATO. That's the value of transatlantic missile defense. Mm. Surely. Uh, very brief, because it was a question what, what, what it means for, uh, for defense of U United States uh, 10 kilometer range uh, uh, treats. Uh, no, if, if, we, if we separate those two things, uh, that, that there is something like uh, US uh, defense and there is something like other NATO members' uh, defense, you are right. There is uh, even 100 kilometers is not a problem of uh, US. But if we are discussing about NATO as a pact, as a system, which, which means that if only one of uh, NATO member has been attacked by somebody even from one kilometer, it is also the problem of other NATO's uh, members, especially of a NATO pillar, which is US. So this is, uh, this is why uh, our obligation is to be... Uh, to, to be um, being a reliable uh, member of NATO, we have to also defend ourselves on treats which are not uh, treats directly to US. I, I don't know if, if, if I understand uh, well uh, your, your question, but this is my response. Yes. Uh, make no mistake, EPA is designed to meet a threat out of the Middle East. It's not designed in any way to go into tail chases, which it won't happen against a Russian strategic rocket forces. It, uh, it's like a Formula One car coming around the corner and uh, I'm standing outside my car and they go catch that before it gets to the finish line and I get my Cinquecento. It, it's not going to happen. So that's the design of the system. Any more questions? We still have a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Bartosz Wisiewski with uh, Polish Institute of International Affairs. The question and the issue of threat perception is, I think, pertinent. I remember a high-ranking U.S. official saying a few years ago, while he was still in the government, that Russia is not and will never be a threat to Poland. So I'm just wondering, this is not a question, it's just a comment, what happens to a person when he or she leaves the administration? Does, it, does the threat perception change depending on when, where, where you stand? Um, in terms of participation of the Polish defense industry in the uh, Polish AMD, the lock uh, key that we're looking for, the, the, the crucial word looking, looking for is Polonization. And uh, is, is what, sorry? Polonization. Yeah. Um, the question is simple. Are we looking for a, uh, a number, a percentage? You mentioned 50% as, uh, as a reasonable share, perhaps. Uh, do you think that any of your, and this is a question directly to, to, to Chairman Kristofsky, would be um, 
it would it be possible for any, any of the partners who are competing in, in or would be competing to offer uh, a specific number? And if so, would you be demanding such a number from, from any of them? Thank you. Wow. Oh, it is, it is uh, easy to answer that not every possible partners could offer us participation in, uh, in this specific Polish system in 50%. But this is something which I would like to underline that I agree with, uh, uh, with uh, one contribution of, uh, of, of Ian about, about that. From our perspective, if we are able to achieve a very interesting technology, working with a partner which uh, gives us chance not to participate in Polish uh, system building in 50%, but maybe 20%, but at the same time to participate in uh, some other system outside of Poland for additional 20, 20, 20% 20 like Ian mentioned. Uh, 12, uh, the 12 uh, multiply 20, it means 240. So uh, from, from, uh, from this perspective, I understand that there are different uh, solutions, different systems. We are coming more now in t technology. In fact, we are discussing now about four maxima maximum five partners which are possible to, to, to participate in this, let's say, tender. There are two partners from U, uh, US, uh, there are one partner from Israel, one partner, and two partners from Europe. Uh, in fact, one partner from Europe, this is uh, partially Europe, partially America. So in fact, uh, we, we have very limited number of possible uh, possible partners, um, and, uh, and we know what kind of offer there is from all of them and uh, some of them because of the construction of the system they are not able to give us uh, more than maybe 20 30 percent so we we know that but but the question is not only what i mentioned before this is not only the question about polish market this is one important thing but i think we sh we shouldn't uh, forget about uh, something which is even much more important than money this is about our uh, independence or dependence as a country for long future uh, f uh, regarding some uh, uh, missile and, uh, and uh, missile defense system technologies. Because uh, we are in the situation in which we are, <coughs> not because we are specifically uh, lazy and, s and stupid nation, but because uh, we were 50, more than 50 years under control, we were not dependent country, and somebody was very, very cautious not to give us chance to develop some technologies. And I think that today we are in a completely different situation, and we, 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 we cannot repeat the same story which we provided 30 or 40 years ago. Today we have chance to develop together with our foreign partners some technologies which, uh, will, uh, which will pay back for, for us and especially not money, not, not from uh, money point of view, but from uh, defense, <coughs> for, from security point of view, for many tens or, or tens years uh, for, for future. So, so I think that uh, what is today the most reli uh, reliable, most expected proposal from our partners for us should be not the participation in money, participation in technology for long future for, for, our, uh, for our defense uh, system, because I think that industry is a part of defense system exactly in the same way like, like armed forces. <coughs> The University of Lower Silesia, uh, Institute of Security and the International Affairs. Um, the last couple of minutes we are moving be between the threat and the capabilities in regards of air defense system, what the Mr. Chairman mentioned. Uh, the issue is that uh, the nowadays we have uh, two theories and the practice the when there is a capability built up on a, a, a threat-driven driv theory, which is uh, from the Cold War, yeah? when they're using the, the Lancaster theory was built uh, based on the uh, enemy or adversary capability. But nowadays, the capability, uh, the planning, the strategic planning is based on the capability-driven model, <coughs> whereas the effect-based approach. And uh, when the Mr. Chairman mentioned about the Polish air defense system, we shouldn't forget about the even written in the famous book of Grand Strategy for, Inform for Information uh, uh, Age about the warden rings and the critical infrastructure protection, what is a key issue for our country. 
So the fully support the idea which were presented by the, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. So we should understand, and also the NATO, there is a threat assessment I cannot mention because of the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but in the threat assessment, they are planning scenario for the contingents and so on. So it's deeper and deeper what we are, let's say, the moving uh, uh, now at, the, at, the, at this uh, subject. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. You definitely have to identify the uh, Just a moment, just a moment. Uh, take your mic. And you will be closing our seminar. All right. <laughs> you hit it right on the head. You have to identify those threat or threats, and then you have to define what you're going to defend, your 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 cow and Dow, and what effect you want to have against those threats to defend it, and then that will drive you to your system or systems that will help help in those defense. So you, you hit it right on the head. So. So, ladies and gentlemen, I I, want, I prepared a, a, a speech at the end. And it was really beautiful, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> as uh, but <laughs> as the buses are, are are already waiting, I would uh, conclude with uh, saying that uh, uh, really uh, uh, we must strike a certain compromise between the. Uh, uh, allies, because of course we touch a very difficult subject of industrial competitions as well, not only security. And I hope that among allies we can you, we can we can uh, find a satisfactory solution for 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 everybody. And well, thank you very much for this. Uh, <laughs> that is, oh, oh.